Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Wednesday night service here in Iceland. Well, I actually can't, uh, I can't sell that idea that we're in Iceland because actually Iceland has a volcano that's erupting right now and uh, some of us would actually like a little warmth, so I can't do that. And so what I can say is we've got, it's an interesting service. We've got a race to the front or a race to the back as far as those in the sanctuary tonight. And uh, I feel like we have a guest speaker who sometimes will say, hello out there in TV land, and that's kind of how I feel tonight. And some of you have made uh, some wise choices. You decided not to take your car out for a spin tonight, and I certainly understand that. It's one thing to drive a few blocks. It's another thing to drive a few miles. And uh, so you're missed tonight, but uh, uh, there are certain things that just don't, um, if you have snow, you know, traction tires and things work really, really well on the snow, but when you have ice rain, not a whole lot of things work well on the ice rain. And so I'm glad that you're tuned in and I wish I could hear you singing from wherever you are. Maybe I can just sing really, really loud uh, at the screen, and you'll see how you do. And Brother Andrew Goodman is just the man to help you do that, and so he's going to lead us in a song. For those of you that are here, let's stand as we sing tonight. All right, we're going to sing number 258 to start. <coughs> 258, Oh, How I Love Jesus. grateful for that and looking here we have Southside Baptist Church we have Northside Baptist Church we have Topside Baptist Church and and Southside Baptist Church is in the winner's circle tonight and what do they win free ice skating after service tonight uh, that's what we win tonight and so anyway grateful that you are here and we're going to begin with a word of prayer tonight dear Heavenly Father we thank you uh, for your great love for us. And we thank you, Lord, that even in times where we have to overcome some things to get to church, I'm always thankful for those who overcome. And also thankful for those, Lord, who, though they know they cannot be here, 
uh, they are uh, doing their best to be here in spirit and, and watching in and participating the best they can. And so we thank you uh, for the opportunity that we have uh, to be in your house, to sing your praises, and to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated, and we're going to sing another song. All right, turn to page 290. 290, my father planned it all. everybody has blue now and so we'll look at that and uh, just we're we're going to kind of just go through the next few days here we just got to get through here we got to get through the weekend and into next week and so we're not going really uh, far beyond that right now uh, we're just we're just happy to be here tonight and uh, obviously the the weather took a turn and we knew it would turn somewhat and uh, one thing we can be grateful for is it was not as bad as, say, what they experienced in Portland. Uh, Portland had a terrible, terrible uh, ice storm this morning, and they're uh, now beginning to thaw out of it, except probably the Eastern Columbia River Gorge. It'll take them a while uh, to thaw out from that. And so one of the things that's happening is different people are trying to get from one location to another with some difficulty. Uh, to, to our church family, uh, the Reagan family did make it to the Tri-Cities safe and sounds, just letting you know that. Uh, um, I'm sure there are stories they could tell, uh, but they did make it. And so anyway, letting you know that. We have a guest speaker on Sunday who's saying, please pray for me because I have to find the right time to get through the Columbia River Gorge. And right now, that would be difficult to do since last I heard the gorge was still closed to traffic. And so we just need to pray for them. Uh, they are trying to get here for Word of God Sunday, and we want them to get here for Word of God Sunday. And so we have different things going on. Uh, Thursday, um, um, homeschools, a game time decision. Uh, we'll find out what uh, the Pendleton School District says. Uh, whether they want children to ice skate to public school or not tomorrow, so we'll find out. Uh, maybe they already made a decision. It could be they made a preemptive decision, so you can look online and 
uh, find out that for our own home school because we tend to follow uh, the public school schedule. When the public school cancels, we go, okay, they don't do that too often. They probably know what to do. Um, so we have that on Thursday. We do have Mackay Creek Estates, a Bible study on Thursday. Uh, that is at 1245, and, and that will uh, take place. And so anyway, just be praying as we prepare for that. And then uh, Faith Bible Institute is supposed to take place uh, tomorrow at 6.30. It's supposed to take place. And a lot of it will depend on whether we get a thaw, which is at this point what we'd rather have, or we get a silver thaw, is what they call it, which we really don't want, where it just continues to freeze rain all day tomorrow. So we will know pretty soon uh, which way that is going to go, and we'll pray regarding that. Friday, there is a teen activity uh, that is due to start here at the church at 3.30. This is a teen ice skating activity. To me, it would seem to be the epitome of irony that an ice activity would be canceled due to ice. Uh, it seems that seems incredibly ironic. It doesn't even seem sensible to me. But, I mean, you never know what's going to happen. But Somerville Baptist Church, at this point, their youth are committed to come. I'm hoping that our teens will come. For our teens, know this, you will need to have a permission card because you are a teenager, and yes, it is ice. And so we will have that. Uh, parents will rest a little easier knowing there's something we can do if you decide to bounce three times off the skating rink. So, uh, so anyway, we have these items. It's going to be a wonderful time. Uh, we'll have games, we'll have get, um, somebody will be speaking, sharing the Word of God, we're going to have food, and so that's going to be a fabulous activity. Now that gets us to Saturday, and hopefully by Saturday we really, truly, sincerely, utterly are thought out, and at 8.30 is the Mighty Men's Breakfast, and so this is for all men. This can be dads, this can be sons as well, but uh, the Mighty Men's Breakfast, I want to talk to you about the year i give you just some more heart about my vision uh, regarding year 2024, and uh, we'll have a great time. So that'll be 8.30 on Saturday. Again, Sunday is Word of God Sunday. We'll have a beautiful display of placards telling how we got our Bible. How did we get our Bible in the English language? It took an incredible amount of sacrifice for this to take place, for us even to have uh, the Word of God. And uh, we find that we live in a day and age where the Word of God is criticized, but even though it's criticized in the United States of America, they don't kill you in the United States of America for having one. They do in other countries, though. They'll kill you for having a Bible. And this is how much the devil hates God's Word, and it's why we need to realize just how wonderful and important God's Word is. So guest speaker, um, uh, Pastor, or I should say now say Brother Rick Adams, his wife Regina, uh, they will be with us the entire day Sunday. We do have, and I'm going to say this very, very carefully for our video audience, we have Berean brunch on Sunday. No, not the last Sunday of the month. We have Berean brunch this Sunday. And you go, why are you saying that? Because as soon as service is over, I'm hoping you're going to start cooking. And so anyway, we have a wonderful time of food and fellowship. We will also have a love offering as we receive an offering for Bibles. And uh, we give a love offering every year for that. Uh, as one pastor said, what good is it if we send people out into the ministry and then they're not given Bibles. He says it's like in a war being given gun, a gun without any bullets. And so we talked about in the importance of that. And so anyway, uh, we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful time. And we're just right now hoping to get to the weekend and get through the weekend. And so uh, we just all need to pray about the weather and uh, just uh, continue to have our wits about us on everything that we do uh, with those items. By the way, uh, have you remembered to pick up your pack yet? And these are packs, again, 31, 31 tracks, 31 days, 31 opportunities to, to hand them out to 31 different people. And so I have been busy 
um, and obviously not busy before we got the tracks, but uh, anyway, trying to get out about two or three a day, and I've been able to kind of keep at that pace. Yesterday, and this shows you how much fun this can be. Yesterday, I gave a track to an individual while I waited in a pharmacy line, and the individual says, well, I can't take that because I already have one in my car because somebody at physical therapy already gave me one this morning. So another member of the church beat me out on that one, but it was kind of fun running into somebody who had received two of them. And, um, and then I, um, I ran into another person today who was uh, you know, an employee at one of our grocery stores, and I gave them one and they said, why, well, thank you. This is the third one I have. I have two others on uh, my shelf at home. So evidently they have been invited before as well. But you know what? We would rather have somebody say we've been invited before than have crowds of people say I've never heard about it. We're trying to take care of that problem. And so this is a wonderful way uh, to take care of that. And so for those of you who are viewing tonight, um, if you want a prayer request list, you can request, uh, you can request a PDF of that prayer list, and uh, you can do that. You can text me, and I will email it to you. Obviously, if you did not do that yet, you're not getting that email anytime in the next hour. But I'm letting you know that you can have that, and that would be helpful for you. I will share this as a prayer request because this is a public prayer request, and that is for our state senator, Bill Hansel. And Bill Hansel, his cancer has returned. He had not had cancer for 20 years, and uh, it came back. He's actually not unhappy. He's actually praising God that they found it because under the typical normal diagnoses to find it, it didn't show up, that it showed up with a different kind of scan and uh, the biopsies tested positive. So he's glad for that because then there's something that can be done. And so anyway, but you just be in prayer for him as he, he goes through that. He has been a good uh, senator on our side of the state. At this time, we're going to have Andrew Goodman and he is going to uh, lead us in a song. The song is called Showers of Blessing, and you can take that any way you want to. Um, I am assuming these showers were above freezing, but anyway, let's stand as we sing this song. Number 235, Showers of Blessings. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing this song. Thank you. 
wonderful, sta- wonderful singing, and please remain standing. Turn in the Word of God to the book of Romans, chapter 12. Romans, chapter 12, verse 1. And uh, we're going to, I have preached an entire message um, on this and the succeeding verse before, and I'm revisiting, but I'm, I'm looking at a different application here, comparative application, and I, I think there's some important things that we need to look at when we understand the state of our day. Not only understanding the state of our country, uh, but understanding the state of what we call Christendom in the United States of America. And we ask, what has happened to our country? What has happened to our churches? And why has uh, that been the case? Uh, I'm going to ask the question, why, before we pray? You know, why do we have a phrase in Scripture that says so much the more, and yet so many churches are assembling together so much the less? And so we have that question. You know, why does there seem to be um, a dialing down instead of a dialing up in our day and age? And there's a reason for that, and, and it's unfortunate But there are some verses that people who claim Christ simply do not like. This is one of those verses. So look with me in Romans chapter 12 and looking in verse 1. The Word of God says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let's have a word of prayer as we look further into the scripture here. Dear Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would help us tonight as we look into your word and as we ask ourselves some very, very serious questions of why the church of God in America is not charging the gates of hell. And we ask, uh, what has happened? And we ask about the concept of complacency. And we ask about the concept, unfortunately, of out-and-out disobedience. And Lord, we realize that every church is a local church, which means we collectively, as a congregation, We understand that there are decisions that we need to make. And when you say the judgment must begin first at the house of God, you are looking at the individual assemblies and the individual houses on planet Earth. And we will be, of course, judged individually as your children. You're born again, you're adopted, you're blood-bought, you're born again children, but uh, also corporately. And so help us to look seriously at this passage and reason among ourselves, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. And I want to point out one word that we read in this passage, and the word is sacrifice. The word sacrifice is a difficult and frankly an un popular word in our day. And here is how sacrifice is signified in our day. Sacrifice is signified when we use our important time to help someone with their unimportant project. And that is what we consider sacrifice. We consider sacrifice when we allow ourselves to be disturbed and inconvenienced for a small amount of time. It's like having to wait five extra minutes in the McDonald's checkout line or waiting for somebody to figure out how they can repark their car 27 times in the parking lot and we have just sacrificed our time. The United States of America does not like the word sacrifice. They consider it inconvenient. It's considered unpopular. Scripture, however, looks at sacrifice a different way. 
And I want to point out a few things to you here as we look at this passage. The word here is, I beseech you. And the word I beseech you is not, hey, I think I'll ask you a question. Or I think I'll make you a simple request. I beseech you means, I beg you. Pay attention to this. And here is the interesting thing. You could also use the term, I urge you. And what's interesting with the term, I urge you, it is the operative word where we get the same concept as the idea of urgent. And urgent means we're running out of time. And the reality is this. Scripture indicates an urgency to God's desired activity for our lives on planet Earth. And so the question is this. Why is sacrifice so hard for us? And the reality is, is because our thinking is upside down when it comes to the concept of sacrifice. The title of the message tonight is called The Urgency of Sacrifice. This is a two-point message uh, for several reasons. One, we want to have a time to pray. And two, I want uh, these folks that are here to be able to get out the door and get home before sunrise. And so uh, we're going to be efficient in what we do. Here is the problem when we look at this term sacrifice and we look at the term reasonable service and we have trouble with that term. Here's number one. The reason we have trouble with the urgency of sacrifice is we think Christ's sacrifice was reasonable. Why don't you stop and think about that? We think Christ's sacrifice was reasonable. And I'm going, really? You think that? You think that, uh, that Christ was obligated to die for you? In this entitlement society, that somehow salvation is an entitlement. I want to point out a few verses here, if you'd look along with me. And since there's a few of you, I know you can look really, really fast. Smaller crowds can look up scriptures a whole lot faster than large crowds. Yeah, that's not true. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, looking at verse 21, it says... For he, that is God, hath made him, that is Christ. So, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. And this is literally saying Jesus has made sin for us and Jesus knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so there is a trade that has taken place. But I mean, I don't consider the trade that reasonable. It says, he who knew no sin paid for our sins. Well, that doesn't seem right. Isn't it more reasonable that the person who did the crime should do the time? Isn't that what we believe? I mean, isn't that what you believe when you yell at your, the network news? Or you pick up a periodical that talks about some injustice and you get irritated and you said, the person who did the crime should do the time. Well, Jesus never did the crime. He who knew no sin paid for our sins. And I ask you, is that reasonable? Here's another one. 1 Peter chapter 3 looking at verse 18. First Peter chapter 3, looking at verse 18. And here it is, similarly worded, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust. So we look at this carefully, and we have a person who is just. We have a person who is right, we have a person who is moral. We have a person who is innocent. And they are paying a price for the guilty. The just 
for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. And so we have the just suffer for the unjust. And then how did this happen? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. I think sometimes we, we do ourselves an injustice because we acknowledge a reality, but we don't actually paint a picture in our minds of what this means. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And you look at the term every one, and you get the same concept as for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And here what you have is we have turned every one to his own way. And this is where you have to paint the picture. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Literally, our iniquity was dogpiled onto Jesus Christ, if I can use a football term, because we all know what a dogpile is in a football game. Our iniquity was dogpiled on Christ. He was literally buried in our iniquity so that he could bear our punishment. And I have to ask, do you really think that is reasonable? Do you think that Christ's sacrifice was reasonable? Do you think that our salvation was reasonable? Do you think God is unfair? I could not agree with you more. He is unfair. He's unfairly merciful. He's unfairly loving. He is unfairly giving. I agree entirely. God is completely and entirely unfair. But he's unfair on the other end of the spectrum from which so many people say he's unfair. Why do people dislike this word sacrifice? Because their thinking is upside down. They think Christ's sacrifice was reasonable, which it wasn't. And they also, we think our sacrifice, well, that would be unreasonable. Even though the scripture plainly says our sacrifice would be reasonable. Here are some very, very interesting verses. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10 and looking at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 10, looking at verse 28. And this is interesting when you, when you run it through the entire lens of thinking here. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now I want to stop here and I want to paint a picture here. Over here we have the law of Moses. The law of Moses cannot save. The law of Moses was the idea of salvation by works. If you thought that you could follow the law for eternal salvation, the law could never save. The law was a schoolmaster to point us to Jesus Christ. It was to teach everybody that they could not achieve sinless perfection. They could not get to a place where they said, Wow, I've really, really pleased God now. You know, uh, you know God should start asking me for favors. Uh, you know, they get that. The law was showing that works cannot save anybody. And it's saying the law is vastly inferior to grace. Because grace is God's mercy and God's sacrifice through the person of Jesus Christ. And it is far superior to the law. The law was just sent there to get us to grace. So you have this inferior law. And it said if anybody despised even that inferior law, that schoolmaster law, they would die without mercy by two or three witnesses. 
So that's what happens if somebody despises the law. What happens if somebody despises grace? And here's what the scripture says. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye? Shall he be thought worthy who hath trotted underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? And it's literally somebody who looks at salvation and they treat it like it's no big deal. For we know him that have said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This is an amazing thing, because what it is saying is this. Punishment for despising grace is greater than for despising works. That is something to roll around in your head a little while. But then also this. In everything that we go through in life, it is rather unlikely that simply resisting sin, simply resisting the impulses to do wrong, is going to result in bloodshed. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 12, and looking at verse 3. And the Bible says, For consider him, I'm going to come back to that, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Just in case you're getting to the point where you think, you know what, I'm sacrificing so much, and this is just too much. And then it says this, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Have any of you, okay, we've got a few parents in here. Have any of you ever done this as a parent? Where maybe you had a child and they disobeyed in a certain way that caused damage to something. And you were upset with them, legitimately, and you wanted them to paint a picture in their mind of the crime they had committed. And so you literally, they're trying to look away, and you turn their face back to what it was and go, look at it. Look at it. Because they broke it or they did it. Look at it. Okay, how many of you do that with dogs? Okay, hands up. You go, uh, the dog tears something up, or the dog um, um, does something not nice on the carpet or the floor, and you take the dog and you go, look at it, look at it. Do you realize that that for consider him, God is saying this, you know, not as an angry parent, but as a benevolent father, but he's saying, look at him. Look at him. Look at the cross of Christ. Look at the blood flowing down from him. Look at what you have done. Your sins did that. And then when you think of sacrifice, say, okay, if you live righteously and turn away from sin, are you going to draw blood? Like Jesus' blood? What an important thing to think about. Thirdly is this. Any kind of sacrifice that we do here on planet Earth as far as whatever we give up, it's, it's just a moment. It's just a little thing. It's just a light thing. And we have to do a comparison. In uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4 and looking at verse 17... The Bible says this. The Bible says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, 
Well, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, meaning on the timeline. We talk a lot about the timeline. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And so this is interesting. You go, how could we look at sacrifice as just a momentary thing? Okay, let's take your entire lifespan, whatever it is, okay? Um, I can tell you with confidence that every single one of you in this room or on the screen, you have not lived your entire lifespan yet. I can tell you that with confidence. Why? Because you're still looking at me. So you're still alive. You have not lived your entire lifespan. But let's take the amount of life you've lived or the amount of time that you think you would live on planet Earth and compare that 60, 70, 80, 90, you don't want to live to be 100, do you? 100 years. Compare that with eternity. Okay. Now, at that point, to be able to look carefully at eternity, we have to zoom out because I'm holding the 100 years, but we got to zoom out so we can see eternity. Okay? We're zooming out. We're zooming out. We're zooming out. We're zooming out. We're zooming. Oh. There's your life on planet Earth compared to eternity. It's a moment. So how much are you sacrificing on planet Earth if you present your bodies a living sacrifice? Wow. Only a moment. So... Are we being unfair when we refuse to sacrifice? And the answer is, yeah, we are. But here's the truth. We've been unfair before. So what do we need to do here? We need to look at a living sacrifice for what it is. It's literally a putting aside of ourselves and our own interests in favor of those things that interest God. By the way, that is the only way that a city like Pendleton is going to come to Christ. It's the only way that that hard to love, hard to reach family member is ever going to get saved. It's going to take some sacrifice. And one of the things that we need to do when we're looking at the concept of reasonable is we need to take a look at God's mercy for us, which is amazing and great. And then we need to look at our moment of opportunity, and sometimes it really is only a moment. And then we need to look at the reward of eternity. And that is called a reward that lasts forever, an eternal reward. Think about this. An eternal reward for a moment of sacrifice. Does that seem reasonable to you? That doesn't even seem reasonable to me. But it's, but it's unreasonable for all the right reasons. What an important thing to look at that reward I think of the people in Antioch that were first called Christians. But the main reason they were called Christians is because they were witnesses and because they knew how to sacrifice. The scripture again, I beseech you, I urge you by the mercies of God. And the term by the mercies of God is having a full awareness of what God's mercy was. For the people in this passage, it was the mercy that God said, no, salvation isn't only for the Jews, salvation is for everybody. That was the mercy of God. And let's look at that. And let's look at anything that we're able to do for Christ is, that's okay. 
God wants me to do that. That's reasonable. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us. And Lord, even our life of difficulty in the type of blessed nation we're in is really a life of ease compared to what so many other people have to go through. Many other countries, if somebody wants to eat today, they need to go out and they need to find their food. They need to prepare their food just so they can eat their food today. Or they need to work today just so they can eat today. And in that sense, Lord, we have it so easy. And we can complain just because the supply truck couldn't get through the gorge today. But the reality is none of us are going hungry. I pray, Lord, help us to be sacrificial in the lives that we live for you and consider it reasonable, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to stand together. We're going to sing song number 53. And song 53 is a song of comparison. It says, when I survey the wondrous cross, when we take a look at Jesus, and then we take a look at ourselves, and then it all comes into perspective. Let's sing this song together. Number 53. 